Okay, so uh, thank you for letting me speak, present my results, well, our results. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, routing in the lighting network. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to talk about routing in the lighting network and more specifically about ant routing. Uh, so the goal of the talk is, uh, first of all, to present how ant routing works and then try to estimate uh, the efficiency of this algorithm. Uh, so I will start by recalling what the Lightning Network is very briefly. Uh, I will briefly present how the, the ant routing works. Uh, then I will go into a little more details uh, about how the ant routing works, specifically detailing uh, what needs what happens in the memory and what the actual algorithm is uh, and then I will talk about uh, actual implementation so uh, I will present AVL trees which is uh, the main tool to implement uh, the ant routing and then the actual implementation and uh, then try to estimate the computational cost of this algorithm uh, the goal being to see uh, we want to see how many transactions uh, this algorithm can handle. So let's start with uh, recalling something about the Lightning Network. So uh, Bitcoin has a scalability problem, namely uh, because of how Bitcoin works with the block size limits, uh, one megabyte and uh, a transaction being about 250 bytes, um, which means, uh, and one block in average every 10 minutes, uh, you can compute that uh, Bitcoin can uh, process around seven transactions per second. And if you compare it to a payment system like Visa, then uh, it's a uh, thousand times less. Uh, so Visa is a thousand, thousand times uh, a lot more transactions uh, than Bitcoin. And so if you want to make Bitcoin into a more general uh, payment system, then we need to solve this problem. And this is the reason why uh, the Lightning Network was introduced in 2017. Uh, so the Lightning Network was designed to address a scalability problem. And th the main idea behind it is that, um, so in, in the original idea of Bitcoin, all the transactions are public and are, need to be published uh, on the blockchain. But the idea behind the Lightning Network is uh, to say that actually you don't need to publish all transactions. Uh, so how does uh, Lightning Network uh, works? So the Lightning Network, it's, uh, it's a second network which is uh, on top of the Bitcoin network. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, it's meant for, uh, to do a lot of micropayments between two Bitcoin users. Uh, the way it works is you have two Bitcoin users, Alice and Bob, and they create uh, a Lightning Network channel by uh, committing funds into uh, a common address, uh, to a two of two multisig address. Uh, and the idea is, so they both put funds uh, on this address. Uh, this creates a Bitcoin transaction which is published on the blockchain, but then uh, simply by updating uh, the balance of that common address, they can do many transactions without actually publishing these transactions on the blockchain because uh, the only thing that they actually need to publish is the very last uh, balance, which means, so they start with a balance which is published on the blockchain, then they do a bunch of transactions, uh, they just update the balance but don't publish it, and then they only publish the very uh, last balance on the Bitcoin and then the channel closes. Uh, and in this way, uh, the Lightning Networks allows to uh, do many more transactions per second. Now, of course, uh, so the Lightning Network, it's not complete, which means uh, you can have some nodes which don't have a channel between them. Uh, but it, the Lightning Network has a good property that you can compose channels, which means, uh, in general, the way the payment works in the Lightning Network is as follows. Uh, so let's say Alice wants to pay Bob. Uh, but there is no direct channel between them. Well, because you can compose channel, uh, if you have a third person, for example, Tom, uh, which has, a, Tom has a channel with Alice and Tom also has a channel with Bob, 
then Alice can pay Bob via Tom. So Alice sends money to Tom and Tom sends money to Bob. And in this way, Alice can pay Bob without actually having a direct channel. Um, but of course, in, in general, uh, you don't really know, like Alice and Bob, they both know they are on the network, but they don't really necessarily know what, uh, if they don't have a direct channel, they don't know how they are connected. Uh, and this leads to the problem of um, if, you have, uh, if you have two persons on the Lightning Network, uh, you need to find a payment path from Alice to Bob. Uh, and so this, in, this is the routing problem, finding a route, a payment route from Alice to Bob. And of course, we would like to do that uh, in a way that is decentralized to preserve the spirit of Bitcoin uh, and uh, as most as possible anonymous, which means we want to find a routing um, without using too much knowledge of the network. So here, uh, what we are assuming is um, we, we want A and B to be able to find a routing without knowing anything of the network. Uh, the only thing that they know is uh, who their direct neighbors are. But apart from that, they don't have any uh, knowledge of the general topology of the, of the network. So, uh, uh, so the question is, how can we uh, find a route without knowing too much about the, the network. Uh, well, this is um, to solve this problem. So Cyril and Ricardo published a paper last year in which they introduced uh, the ant routing algorithm, uh, which they propose as a routing algorithm for the Lightning Network. So what is uh, ant routing? Uh, so first of all, why is it called ant routing? Uh, it's because uh, this routing algorithm is inspired by ants behavior. So the ants, when they are walking around looking for food, uh, they start by looking in random directions, uh, but as they walk, they leave a pheromone uh, behind them. And these pheromones that they leave uh, allow them to find their way back. And uh, if they find food, these traces, uh, these pheromones indicate the way to the food. And the idea of the ant routing is to do that, which means uh, the idea that Alice will send pheromones everywhere, not everywhere on the network, Bob will send pheromones everywhere on the network. And when a pheromone from Bob meets a pheromone from Alice, uh, this means there is a path. So I, I will uh, show you pictures afterwards to uh, uh, explain a little more. So uh, how does it actually work? Um, well, we assume that Alice and Bob have a direct communication channel, uh, but of course they don't necessarily have a direct payment channel because otherwise there is no point in routing. Um, so the way it works is, so Alice and Bob, uh, they agree on some random number. Uh, and then uh, they create, so this random number is basically what uh, we call the pheromone. Um, well, actually, they, each of them, so Alice adds the bit zero to this random number, and Bob adds uh, the bit one to this random number. And these are what we call the pheromone seeds. Uh, so Alice and Bob have uh, different pheromone seeds, but they only differ by the first bit. And now w once they have created that, what they do is uh, Alice sends the pheromone seeds to all her neighbors and then Bob does the same. And then the nodes, uh, they keep forwarding the, the pheromone seeds. Uh, they send it everywhere. And they keep forwarding the seeds until a seed from Alice meets a pheromone seed from Bob. And when that happens, uh, we say there is a match. And when there is a match at some node, then the node uh, creates uh, what we call a matched seed, uh, which is a pheromone seed to which we add uh, another bit, zero. And then uh, this node sends back the matched seed uh, the way they came, the way the pheromone seed came, and this traces a route from A to B. So here is a, so I took the graph that I drew earlier. So uh, this, uh, now I'm, I'm going to show how the algorithm works. So in red, we have the pheromone seeds from Bob and in blue, the pheromone seeds from Alice. 
So at the beginning, uh, they've just created their pheromone seeds. Um, so now Alice sends the seed to all her neighbors, and Bob does the same. Uh, and now this neighbor here will do the same. This uh, node will send uh, the pheromone seeds here and here, and the blue one will do the same. And now you see what, what is going to happen here is that uh, a seed from Alice will meet a seed from Bob. Uh, so this means there is a match. And now all this node has to do is it sends back the match. Uh, so it creates a match seed and it sends it to Alice and to Bob uh, the way it came. Uh, so I, I don't know if you can see the colors very well. Uh, <laughs> yes, maybe there was a, maybe the light is not so good. Uh, but this so this traces the route from uh, from A to B. So of course this is a particularly simple example because there is only one route from A to B. But in general, if you take a, a more general graph, there could be several routes. So for example, in this graph, so if we so here you will have three matches, and this traces uh, three different routes uh, from A to B. So what happens is, uh, in general, uh, there will be several matches, and so Alice will receive several matches. So what we do is, uh, whenever a match is created, the node also generates a random number which we call ID, uh, ID for identity because uh, it's a random number which identifies the match. We need to do that because there are several, possibly several different matches. And now um, after some time, so Alice waits, once she has sent a pheromone seed, she waits. And after some time, she will receive uh, several match seeds, each of them with their own identity. And then she chooses one uh, and once she has, she has chosen, she creates what we call a confirmed seed uh, and she sends it to Bob. And this confirmed seed uh, traces a route from A to B and it signifies, it tells Bob uh, that she has chosen a route and then the payment can uh, proceed. Now there is uh, uh, another detail that I want to address is... Um, so we want to prevent uh, too much information to be relayed on the network. Oh, maybe I should draw over there. Yeah. So um, we we add a counter to seeds because uh, so for example, if you have if you have Alice which is here. Uh, so an, an idea which is important to remember is that in general, the same node will receive the same pheromone seeds several times. Because for example, uh, here, Alice sends her pheromone to this node, but she also sends it here. And so this, this node here will also send it uh, to this node, okay? Uh, so this node has received uh, the same pheromone seeds twice, but now we add a counter, which means, so for example, Alice uh, starts with counter zero, and the, the counter counts how many nodes the seed has gone through. Okay, so the counter is increased by one uh, at, at each hop. So uh, when this node receives the counter, the, the seed, it sets the counter to one, um, and this node also sends a counter to one. But now, uh, when this node sends a seed here, this node will receive um, S with uh, counter equals two, because there has been two hops. And what we do is we decide that uh, when a node receives the, same, receives the same seed several times, it only keeps the one with the lowest counter. So for example, uh, here, wh when it receives the seed from here, this node here will just ignore it because it has already received the seed from Alice directly 
and so it will ignore the second one because uh, it has a higher counter. And this prevents uh, too, ma too many seeds to be sent on the network because otherwise, if you don't have counter, then uh, the nodes could, would keep propagating the seeds. And for example, it could keep looping in, uh, uh, indefinitely. And this would send too, many, uh, too much information on the network. Now, another way we can also uh, restrict uh, how much information is sent on the network is Alice, for example, can choose uh, to indicate how much fees uh, she's willing to pay. And then we can say that the nodes uh, only relay the seed if the accumulated fees uh, don't exceed what Alice wants. So this way, if, if a root has too much fees, uh, it, the seed uh, stops being forwarded because, and, and uh, it's better if it's not forwarded because then Alice wouldn't want to use that root anyway, so that root would be useless. Okay, so that's uh, basically how it works. So I just explained uh, the rough idea of the ant routing. Uh, now, this, uh, this routing allows for decentralized and anonymous routing. So note that uh, in this routing algorithm, uh, all the nodes do the same thing, and they don't, they don't need to know anything about the network uh, except who their neighbors are. Uh, they don't need any uh, knowledge of the topology of the network. Now, the question is, uh, how efficient is this algorithm? And uh, is it compatible with the goal of uh, solving Bitcoin scalability problem? Uh, and for example, if you want to ask a very uh, explicit question, for example, could this algorithm handle 10,000 transactions per second? Okay, so now I'm going to uh, detail a bit more uh, the algorithm, well, the ant routing. So um, what do the nodes need to keep in memory? So uh, as I said, there are three kinds of seeds. So all the, se all the nodes, they keep three kinds of, they, I mean, they, they allocate space uh, in their memory uh, for the routing task. And this memory, can, this memory will contain three kinds of seeds because they are the pheromones, the matched and the confirmed seeds. Now, if we look at the pheromone seeds, what do they need to keep uh, in their memory? Well, they keep the pheromone seed itself, of course. Also a counter, I already explained uh, why they need, uh, we need to add the counter. Uh, they also need to keep in memory uh, the, the name of the node from which they receive the seed. Uh, this is because um, they need to, when they receive a match, they need to, the, the match needs to go back to Alice. And so if they want to trace back the route to Alice, uh, they need to keep in mind who sent the seed. Um, also, as I said, if Alice decides to add fees, uh, they need to keep these fees in memory. So they keep uh, uh, the maximal amount of fees that Alice wants to pay. And also they need to keep track of how many fees have accumulated on the route. Um, okay, and uh, but when they, when pheromones are forwarded, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't send everything because uh, they don't need to send uh, this one. If, uh, in order to preserve anonymity as much as possible, they send as little information as possible, so uh, they, don't, uh, they only send the rest. Oh, and uh, yes, timestamp. They also keep a, um, a timestamp, which is associated to each seed. Um, this is because uh, the seeds after some time, it needs to be eliminated, right? Because uh, uh, well, you, you, want the, you want the memory, you want to keep the memory space uh, as uh, small as possible. Uh, so it's, uh, so uh, regularly you have to clean the, the memory. Uh, you have to remove seeds which are too old, which is why you keep a timestamp. Uh, well, for match seeds, it's a bit uh, similar, except you have uh, you also need to keep the ID, the identity of the match, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Each match seed has an identity attached to it. Uh, and then they keep, uh, instead of keeping in mind the person that send them the seeds, they keep in mind, so their target, which means, so the match, the role of the matches is, is to indicate the path from Alice to Bob. So they only keep in memory the next node in the path. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. 
I mean, that's all they need to keep in memory to uh, trace the route. Uh, they also keep uh, the fees. So th these are the total fees corresponding to the route. Uh, they need to keep that in memory because they need to inform when Alice receives the match seed, she needs to be informed of how much fees she would pay for each route. Uh, and also, uh, yes, so the counter, uh, the timestamp is, uh, well, same as before because uh, seeds need to be eliminated when they are too old. Um, yes. And so why, uh, okay, maybe I need to explain uh, the counter for match seeds, how it works. Um, this is because so if you have, uh, let's say you have uh, a match here. So uh, the match, uh, so when the pheromone seed uh, went to the match, it, the, the counter increases, but when the match seed uh, uh, is sent back to Alice, it does the opposite, so the counter decreases at each step. And the purpose is uh, when, when the match is, uh, is sent back here, So at each up, it decreases the counter, and uh, it needs to check that these counter are the same, uh, because otherwise, uh, it could be that, um, for example, if if this node has received uh, this seed first and then this one, uh, then the counter will have changed, and so the, the counter here is is used to make sure that uh, when the match seed goes back to Alice, the route that it's following really corresponds to, uh, uh, to the right route. Okay. Now there are the confirmed seeds and uh, all they need to, uh, um, so the seeds, are, yeah, basically all they need to have is the identity. Uh, so this is the identity of the corresponding match and uh, they keep the target uh, so the target is the next node in the path and also a timestamp always for the same reason because uh, they need the ones that are too old needs to be eliminated. So this uh, allows us to uh, kind of estimate uh, how much memory space would be taken uh, in order to do this routing task. So um, here I put so this corresponds to the three kinds of seeds, so the pheromones, the matched, and the confirmed seeds. Uh, each of them has some information attached to it. Uh, and here in this uh, table, I uh, specified how much uh, memory you need for each of these. So maybe, the, so the seed you want to be, uh, you want a random number and you want it big enough so that there is no collision. So maybe four bytes is actually enough, but let's say you want eight bytes to be sure. Um, now for the, what I call neighbor depends on the case is either the, it's for example, it could be the sender, so the, the node which sends the seed, or it could be the target, which means the next node in the path. Um, and so you see that uh, the pheromone seeds, uh, yeah, they're about, uh, they should be about 25 bytes. Uh, the other ones are not much more. And so for one transaction, because uh, in general for, need, for one transaction, I mean for one routing task, I mean, um, you need to keep the three kinds of seeds, so it will take about uh, 81 bytes. Because the match seed, uh, most, most of the memory space is used by, by feral one seeds, because people don't, don't receive all the match seeds. No, of course not. Um, some are, yes, so this is, uh, this is actually an upper bound. It's not really uh, all the memory you use because uh, this, um, okay, some of the nodes will have all these three kinds of seed in memory, but of course some nodes uh, don't even receive much seeds. So in this case, uh, this would take even less memory. Uh, this is an upper bound on the memory used, okay? It's, uh, 
Uh, yes. Why is the neighbor only one byte? Oh, uh, this is because, yeah, I mean, uh, so nodes don't have uh, that many neighbors. So I, I mean, I think you only need one byte to just uh, keep track of who is, uh, you know. And uh, yeah, because, so you need a big number for the seed because uh, you need it to be random enough that there is no collision between two different people. Uh, and timestamp, uh, I believe it takes uh, eight bytes. Uh, but then for the, other, for the other things, you don't need that big numbers. So, uh, which is why I put these numbers. Okay. And if you compare it, for example, to a Bitcoin transaction set, uh, you can see that it's uh, a lot smaller. So uh, the mempool, the general mempool should be uh, uh, smaller than the, the Bitcoin mempool. So now, uh, is there, is there any questions about this? Yeah. yeah, but on average, it's much less is more of the server one, like 50 bytes. I mean, uh, which, the number of matches is much smaller than the total. Yes, number. yes. So this is, uh, this number here is an upper bound for one node, uh, for, 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 for one, for one routing. No, 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 not, not, not every node, yes, yes. 30, 40, but so uh, not, not every node will uh, have to store 81 bytes of data for one routing task. Okay, in general, it would be less than that. Yes. Uh, do we need the server uh, seed when we have a match and then confirm, or can we just uh, delete it, maybe? Um, I, uh, no, I don't think so, because what could happen is so uh, the same node could receive several match seeds, okay? And you don't know beforehand how many match seeds you will receive. So maybe even if you receive a match seed, you may still need the pheromone seed if you receive another match seed, okay? Also, if for example, uh, like as I said, uh, you want to keep the, the seed with the lowest counter, like for example, it could be that you receive a seed with a big counter and for some reason, I don't know, there is some delay on another node and later you receive one with a lower counter. Um, I think you need to keep um, the pheromone seed even when you receive one match seed. What? I think, okay, when you receive a confirmed seed, I think you can raise uh, you can raise the rest, I think. Yeah, because then uh, when you receive a confirmed seed, it means Alice has chosen a route. So it should be okay to delete it, yeah. So yeah, again, uh, yeah, good, good remark uh, that, uh, yeah, again, this is an upper bound. So actually it's, uh, you can, like you can modify it, improve it so that it actually takes uh, a, lot, a lot less than that, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, I, I will uh, talk, uh, th actually there is a reason I will talk about it uh, on the next slide. Uh, okay, so talking about memory, also as I said, uh, seeds have a lifetime uh, and we need to decide how long the seeds live in memory. Uh, and this, uh, this, the choice of this eta is important because, uh, of course, on the one hand, uh, you want to, uh, you want eta to be big enough so that the routing ta task can actually succeed. But also, it's good to, to keep eta as small as possible because uh, this reduces. I mean, you want to keep the memory taken as small as possible. So uh, you want an, uh, an optimal choice for eta. Uh, and the main, so uh, basically this choice uh, depends on how long the routing ta task takes. And this basically depends on the propagation speed uh, of data on the network. Uh, and so we, we want to figure out how fast uh, this routing task will take in order to determine eta. Uh, so here is what we did. Uh, so it's kind of hard to get precise uh, measure of uh, transactions, I mean, 
the speed of transaction propagation on the Lightning Network. Uh, but uh, we had the idea to use uh, the Bitcoin network as a proxy for Lightning. Uh, both of them are topologically similar in the sense that they are richly connected network. Um, and we can actually assume that, um, I mean, the, in the routing task on the Lightning network, the data propagation will actually be quicker than uh, transaction propagation for uh, Bitcoin. Uh, because, well, there are two reasons for this is, um, as I said earlier, which is also why I compare it to uh, the size of Bitcoin transaction. So the seeds, uh, they were 25 bytes. And this is uh, a lot smaller than uh, the Bitcoin transaction. So it should be transferred more quickly from one to, to the other. And also uh, the task of a node in the routing is just performing a lookup and insertion algorithm basically. So it's uh, a lot more quick than um, transaction verification in the Bitcoin network. So for example, uh, if you like, uh, we, we will see later that uh, basically the cost of treating a seed is basically 10 to the minus five seconds. And uh, so data taken from, I think it's from Statoshi, uh, the website tells you that uh, the transaction verification ten, takes about uh, two to 10 to the, minus two seconds. So it's a lot faster with the routing task. And so the idea is we can use the Bitcoin network as a proxy. Uh, and so we got the, um, on, the on, on Bitcoin stats, there is this information uh, about the speed of transaction propagation. And specifically, it said that uh, in 2014, uh, it took a transaction uh, zero eight seconds to reach 50% of the nodes. And when you think about it, that's uh, basically all we need to know because if you want to know, uh, I mean, if you know how long it takes for a seed to reach 50% of the nodes, then this is basically how long it takes uh, to find a match. I mean, you can expect that after this time, most of the matches will have occurred. Uh, which means that, in theory at least, uh, we can expect that if we put eta in uh, equal two seconds, it should be enough, it should be leave enough times uh, for the routing task to, to process. Which also tells us uh, that we can expect the, the, the complete routing task to, take, uh, to be done in like three seconds. Um, now also estimating the uh, the total size of the mempool. Uh, okay, so we saw that, okay, I, I said the memory taken is 81 bytes, but as we said earlier, it's actually an upper bound. Uh, but let's say that uh, memory space is 81 bytes. Uh, then if we have, if we, so lambda is uh, the number of transactions per second, uh, then the total size uh, taken in memory will be 81 times uh, eta times lambda. Uh, and if you, if you set, for example, lambda equal to 10,000, 10, which is the goal that we, uh, we were aiming for, uh, then you arrive at the size of 2.5 megabytes. But again, this is uh, a very gross, uh, grossly estimated upper bound, which means it should actually be a lot less than that. Uh, yeah, and if you compare it to the Bitcoin mempool, it's uh, a lot smaller than the peaks you can have on the uh, on the size of the Bitcoin mempool. Uh, is there any question about uh, memory? Okay, so now, uh, just a few more, more precisions uh, on how the uh, the algorithm works. So I, I was talking about timestamps at the beginning. Uh, well, actually the timestamp the timestamp is agreed upon at the beginning between uh, Alice and Bob. Uh, so here is uh, how the algorithm works. So uh, yeah, as I said, there is uh, earlier, there is a bunch of information attached to each seed. So you have uh, the counter, sender. So this is, uh, the node that sends the seed, okay? So uh, when they start, 
So they agree on timestamp uh, and on the random number S, which will form the pheromone seed. Uh, now Alice uh, also generates a random number. Oh yeah, maybe I didn't mention this, but uh, when I talked about counters, I said we need to uh, add a counter to each pheromone seed. Well, uh, this could potentially uh, threaten the anonymity uh, of the thing because when a node receives um, a seed with the counter, then it knows uh, the distance from uh, from them, I mean, from the player to, to them. So potentially it's a threat to uh, anonymity, but uh, you can uh, modify that by, uh, instead of uh, starting with a counter zero, Alice can choose a random number and starts a counter at a random number instead. Uh, so this is what we do. So Alice uh, initializes a counter with a random number uh, and uh, she chooses the maximal fee uh, she sends this information to Bob. Uh, each of them insert, so they, they keep the pheromone in, in memory. Uh, so they put zero, zero because these are the, the fees. So the fees at the beginning are zero. And this is the sender because uh, this Alice is the original creator of the pheromone seed. So she sets sender to zero. Bob does the same. Uh, and then at time t, the timestamp that they agreed upon, uh, Alice sends all this information to all her neighbors and Bob does the same. Uh, okay. Now, what is uh, so? What is basically the algorithm followed by a node uh, when it receives a seed? So here you have uh, a seed X, which receives a pheromone seed with the uh, information attached to it. Okay, from some node Y. Uh, so what does uh, what is the algorithm for treating the seed? Well, the first thing the node uh, does is it checks the fees. Okay, so it takes the fees that it receives, it adds its own fees, and if it's bigger than what Alice wants, then you just uh, quit means, uh, just quit the program and nothing happens. So the seed is discarded, it's not forwarded anymore. Now, if the fees are not exceeded, then uh, the node checks for the presence of P in memory. So the node wants to know if it has already received P before or not. So um, if it's not in memory, then it inserts uh, the, the seed in memory with all the information attached to it. Uh, if it's already in memory, uh, with, so the seed is already in memory, but with some other information, so the counter could be different. So it checks the counters. Uh, if the counter is not smaller, then uh, just quit, which means uh, the, the seed is discarded. It's not forwarded anymore. Now, if the counter is lower, then uh, the node replaces the old seed with the new seed. Uh, I mean, it just replaces the information attached to the seed. Okay. Uh, so the, this is the first thing that it does. And then uh, P bar, yeah, I didn't say what P bar is, but um, so P bar means uh, it's a, uh, P bar is the other one. So basically here, it's uh, the node is checking if there is a match. So the node checks if there is a match. So if there is no match, then, uh, then the seed is forwarded uh, with the counter increased and fees added. But if there is a match, uh, as I said, when there is a match, uh, the pheromone seeds are not forwarded anymore. And uh, so it doesn't forward the seed. Uh, it creates a match. Uh, and then it will uh, send the match back uh, to Alice and Bob. So it does, uh, so this function create and send match. Uh, so what it does is, uh, well, do, okay. So if you have uh, if you have received both both pheromone seeds uh, from Alice and from Bob, then what it does it uh, you create uh, two pheromone uh, you, you create two match seed actually, one which is uh, for Alice and the other one for Bob, uh, generates the random number, and then sends back it keeps uh, the match seed in memory, and then it keeps so M of A is sent back to Alice, and M of B is sent back. Bob, uh, 
and uh, yeah, that's basically it. So that's all the the seed. That's all the node does uh, to treat seeds. Okay. Uh, is there any question? Okay. Now, uh, why is there two different kinds of uh, match seed? One from Bob and one from Alice. Well, because uh, the treating a match seed uh, will depend on if it comes, if it goes to Alice or if it goes to Bob. So, um, if a node receives a match seed, so with epsilon equals uh, zero or, or one. Now, if epsilon equals zero, then it looks for the uh, uh, the seed from Alice, and uh, as I said. It needs to check that uh, the counter associated to the match is the same as the counter uh, associated to the pheromone seed. And if it's not the case, uh, it quits. Now, if the counters match, uh, then it stores uh, the match seed with, uh, uh, yes, so it's, this is uh, the target. So this is the next node in the path, okay? And it stores Y because uh, the, the seed was received uh, uh, from Y, okay? Which means that Y is the next node in the path. Uh, and then it sends to S. So S was uh, the, the node which sends the pheromone seed, okay? And now if epsilon equals one, it's the same, but instead of searching for the pheromone from Alice, it search, searches for the pheromone from Bob. Um, and uh, this time, the target is uh, S. So the target is uh, the node from which, uh, I mean, the node that sends the pheromone seed, okay? Okay, is it clear? Okay, and then, uh, yeah, to treat a uh, confirmed seed. Well, it's basically always the same. Uh, the same operation is you receive a seed, you do a lookup, you take the information that you find. So here you do, when you receive a confirmed seed, then you look up in your, in your match seed and uh, you take the information that you need. So in, in this case, the information you need is uh, the target. So you need to retrieve uh, the next, uh, next seed, uh, the next node in the path. Okay, so this is uh, uh, now how the uh, unfooting works. Now, how can we uh, implement uh, this? So, as you, as you just saw, uh, the main task of Node is to perform a bunch of lookups and insertions uh, in memory. So we want to have a data structure which has uh, fast, which allows for fast uh, lookup and fast insertion. And for this, uh, we want to use uh, AVL trees. So AVL stands for the, the people who invented uh, this kind of data structure. So uh, Adelson, Velsky, and Landis. So let me, uh, I'm going to recall what AVL trees are. So uh, yeah, an AVL tree, so it's a kind of binary search tree. So what is a binary search tree? It means, uh, so it's a tree where uh, basically, if you each each node of the tree is labeled with an integer, and if you go, if you descend to the left, then uh, the integers decrease, and if you go to the right, the integers increases. Uh, and we say that the tree is balanced. Uh, basically, it means uh, the left child, so the left child and the right child of a node can have different heights, but this height, this difference, cannot be more than one. So. Uh, here I drew a, a picture uh, to show what a AVL tree is. So you can uh, you can check that in this in these trees, uh, whenever you whenever you go to the left, the integer decreases, and whenever you go to the right, the integer increases. Okay, and it's it's actually more than that because uh, actually everything to the left of 37 is smaller than 37, and then everything to the right of 37 is more. And 37, and this is true for all the nodes. Uh, and balanced, we wanted balanced means uh, so here, for example, so some of the 
yeah, so some of the nodes can have only one child that's allowed. Uh, but what we don't have is we don't want to have uh, a node which has too long a branch on one side and uh, a shorter branch on the other side. So for example, here this node is not balanced because here it has height three, but here it has only height one. Uh, and so the good kind of tree, of course, is uh, balanced. So if you have a balanced uh, binary search tree, you call it an AVL tree. Uh, now there is a, a very natural lookup and insertion algorithm for binary search trees. Uh, so assume you have a binary search tree and you, want, you have an integer n and you want to find out if n is in the tree. So you want to do a lookup for n. Well, you start at the root uh, and now you look at the label of the root. If uh, your integer n, which you are looking for, is smaller, then you go to the left. And if, uh, if it's bigger, then you go to the right. And now you just repeat. You do the same thing at the next uh, node. And then you, you, you stop either when you, uh, when you find a node with label n or when you reach a leaf. So if you reach a leaf, that means that n is not in the tree. So this tells you, um, yeah, so e either you, you find n and then you know n is in the tree or you end in a leaf, in which case you know that uh, n is not there. And after you have done that, uh, insertion is immediate because uh, it doesn't, this lookup algorithm doesn't just do a lookup, it also tells you where, where to insert n if you want to insert it. So here is an example if you, uh, Let's say you have this tree and you want to look for 65. So uh, you start at the root. Now 65 is bigger than 37, so you go right. Uh, it's smaller than 83, so you go left. It's bigger than 61, so you go right. And now you have, um, so you reach a leaf and it's not 65, which means 65 is not in the tree. And you know you have to insert it uh, here. Uh, the problem here is that uh, you end up with a with an unbalanced tree. So, um, uh, so what is the cost of this uh, algorithm? If you have a binary search tree, then uh, in the worst case, uh, it could take O of n, uh, because if you have a degenerate tree with uh, with just one branch, uh, like a linear, it gives you a linear structure. Uh, but if you have an AVL tree, then it's uh, guaranteed to to run in log n. Uh, but we need to modify the insertion if you want to uh, keep the uh, AVL trees. So if you want to keep the tree balanced, uh, you need to uh, modify the insertion a little. So if I take again the example from the last slide, so here we have a tree which is, uh, we just inserted 65, but the tree is now uh, unbalanced. So if we want to work with AVL trees, we need to uh, modify the insertion. And we do this by uh, operations on the, on the tree, uh, which are called rotations, which is uh, what I have on this slide. So uh, yeah, the way it works here is basically uh, you move Y up and then you move uh, the link between T2 and Y moves to a link between uh, T2 and Z. And then you have the symmetric operation here. And by doing these operations, when you insert, you can, uh, you can rebalance the tree. Uh, so how do you do that? So assume you just inserted uh, a node, but the tree is now unbalanced. So what you do is you start from this new node, which you, you just inserted, and you move up towards the root of the tree. And uh, when you move up, uh, so you, you update the height of each node because uh, since you inserted, some heights may have changed. And with this new height, uh, at some point, maybe you will encounter a node which is unbalanced. So you stop at the first node which is unbalanced, Z. And then uh, with, if Y is the bigger, the higher child of Z and X the higher child of Y, then you can rebalance 
uh, the tree by doing these rotations operation on X, Y, Z. Uh, and the exact sequence of operations which you need to do depend on the uh, positions of X, Y, Z. So there are four possible cases. Um, so here are two cases, for example, if uh, so if you have this case, you, you just need one rotation. And you can check that if you do this rotation, then, uh, then you end up with a balanced tree. Uh, if you have this case, you need to do two rotations. So a first rotation at Y and then a rotation at Z. Okay. And if you, if you started at the beginning with an AVL tree, then uh, you end up after these rotations with an AVL tree. Uh, and here are the symmetric operations. So it's basically the same, but uh, it's symmetric. So for example, if I take again the example from earlier, uh, here we just inserted uh, 65, but it wasn't balanced. So uh, you move up. So 78 is still balanced. 61 is still balanced. Now 83. Uh, 83 is the first node, which is uh, unbalanced. Uh, so now you, you've reached the first node, which is unbalanced. So you do a rotation 61 and then a second one at 83, and you end up with this tree and this one is balanced. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is how AVL trees work. And the important uh, thing to take from that is uh, with AVL trees, uh, you have a data structure which, is, uh, which does a lookup and insertion in time log two of n. Why? Because, uh, so if, as I said earlier, if you do the normal insertion, the one from the beginning, uh, uh, this is log two of n. Then what you do once you've done the normal insertion, you have to move up the tree, but uh, even if you move all the way to the root, then this only takes log n. And then the rotations are done in constant time because at most you have to do two rotations. Uh, you, you only have to do two rotations, so it takes con constant time. And so the total cost is uh, logarithmic. So this does uh, look, up and look up and insert in logarithmic time. Okay, so now uh, how do we uh, implement the uh, ant routing algorithm with that? So uh, yeah, as I said, the main task of nodes in the ant routing is uh, doing lookup and inserts. And so we just saw that AVL trees are a very efficient way of doing lookup and insert. So uh, this is what we uh, want to implement for the ant routing. Um, and so there are three kinds of seeds. And so the, the node will keep uh, each kind of seed in a separate tree. So there is a tree for pheromone seed, a tree for match seeds, and a tree for confirmed seeds. Now, more, more precisely, uh, here I, I described uh, how it's uh, implemented, but I will, do, I will uh, draw here a picture. It's probably, it's probably easier to understand with a picture. Um, so remember that uh, we want to keep track of how old the seeds are. And I said earlier that uh, to each seed, we need to keep also keep in memory the timestamp. Well, actually there is a better way to, uh, to manage uh, the age of seeds is, so for example, TP is uh, the tree in which we keep the pheromone seeds. Well, what you do is um, at the beginning, at the root, you have uh, several branches. So you have k many branches. And okay, so at the end of each of these branches, you have a tree. And these trees are AVL trees. So they're binary, binary tree. And, so this is an AVL tree. You have a, so this is T1, T2, etc. Ouais, c'est vrai. Oh, c'est bon, ça, ça doit aller comme ça. Uh, yeah, so each of these 
uh, T1, TK, it's an AVL tree. And uh, these trees are labeled with the seeds. So, uh, so it's ordered, I mean, the, the order in the tree is given by the, by the seeds. But each of these one uh, corresponds to a time interval, which is why they are, uh, at the beginning, it's not binary, it's uh, they are k-many, because uh, you actually, you split the time in k-many interval. So eta, uh, eta is, uh, you remember, it's a lifetime of seeds. So you split eta uh, in k interval of time. Uh, for example, you can choose uh, you can choose k so that each time interval is uh, equal to uh, 0 0.1 second. Uh, you can choose another len length of time, but it's just uh, an idea. And so uh, each of these corresponds to uh, a time interval. And what you do is, uh, when, you receive, when the node receives a seed, it looks at the timestamp and it introduces the seed in the corresponding tree. Okay. So uh, depending on which time interval the timestamp uh, belongs to, uh, it will, uh, the, the node inserts the seed in uh, the corresponding tree, okay? And so this here uh, is the oldest tree. And when you reach, for example, the time T0 plus eta, this means that all the seeds which are older than uh, eta, these need to disappear but all of them are kept in this tree. So all you have to do is uh, you remove this tree, okay? And uh, then you just create a new tree, uh, which is uh, in this new tree, you will put the seeds from the new time interval from uh, uh, T1 until uh, T1.01. Okay. And uh, this is, yeah, this is a rather effective way of dealing with uh, uh, deleting seeds because here you have to delete a, a whole, I mean, you just have to delete this tree and you don't have to, um, for example, if you just had one tree which doesn't, uh, in which you put all the seeds uh, without looking at how old they are, then if you want to delete the old one, you need to search every node of the tree in order to know which one are old. Um, and so it takes uh, more time. This is more efficient. Uh, so the important thing is, yeah, to remember now that there are k-mini trees. Um, okay, and now uh, we have k-mini trees and we want to try to estimate uh, with this data structure, how long does it take to perform the different, uh, the, the routing tasks, so the lookups and the insertion in the, in the algorithm. Uh, so yeah, let's let's first try to figure out uh, how long does it take to perform all the necessary tasks for the pheromone seeds, okay? So uh, the node mostly does lookups and inserts in an AVL tree, okay? That's roughly all it does. And we know that uh, both of these operations, uh, insert and uh, lookup, uh, they're done in logarithmic time so n is uh, the number of seeds in, in, the, in the tree. And uh, yeah, it does. Um, so when it's looking for a seed, it doesn't uh, look up on one of these trees, which uh, uh, basically if, if seeds are, well, it basically has size uh, n over k, okay? And uh, Yes, now we want to uh, compute uh, the total time taken to uh, treat all these seeds. Uh, so we had, uh, all we have to do is count how many lookups we have to do and how many insertions we have to do. So uh, here I take, uh, so it's a bit unfortunate because I choose, uh, this is L, but it looks exactly the same as I. But uh, so this is L, this is uh, the number of lookups that you have to perform on uh, pheromone seeds. So remember that uh, in general, a node will receive the same seed several times, which means uh, it will do uh, uh, several lookups for the same seed. Uh, but it only has to do one insertion. So the time to treat pheromone seeds is basically L, al L alpha plus beta times log of n over k, okay? Because L many lookups and one insertion. 
Uh, now for the match seeds, uh, well, we don't really know how many match seeds uh, the node will receive. Uh, so I call k this number. And basically it does, uh, each time it receives a, a match seed, uh, it does an insertion. Uh, but it only has to do a lookup once, uh, at most once. Uh, this lookup is when it, uh, it is done during the confirm seed phase, because when it receives a confirm seed, it needs to look up the match seed. Okay. Uh, and then for the confirm seed, you just need to uh, do one insertion. Okay. So this gives you this formula, uh, which tells you, uh, uh, this formula tells you how long it takes, uh, basically to perform uh, all the tasks for one routing task uh, with, um, yeah, with n many uh, n many seeds in uh, k k many trees. Okay. So we we determined so alpha and beta are the coefficients in front of the log, and we determined them uh, experimentally. So we implemented uh, this uh, this algorithm. I mean, this data structure AVL trees with lookup and insert. We uh, did a program in C with, uh, uh, with, this, compu with this computer. And uh, so it's uh, with a computer with uh, 2.5 gigabytes. And uh, so this is uh, results that we, uh, we have. So in, uh, here you have uh, the size of the mempool. Uh, so actually this is, um, this tells you the insertion time of a tree depending on how many nodes the tree the tree has okay uh, so we we did it we measured the time we measured how long uh, it takes to insert an, uh, a seed in the tree and we did that for several sizes uh, of the of the mempool okay and basically it's in the order of magnitude of uh, 10 to the minus 5 and this gives uh, we also got the coefficient beta. Now the same for lookup. We did the same for lookup. And again, it's slightly more, uh, sl slightly quicker than insertion. Uh, and we got the alpha that we wanted. Uh, and then here you have the justification of what I said earlier. Uh, I told you that, uh, I told you it takes about 10 to the minus five seconds to uh, treat a seed. Uh, so here it is, it's you, you see it on this graph. And yeah, it takes a lot, it's a lot quicker than uh, transaction verification in the Bitcoin network. Now with these values of alpha beta, we can estimate uh, how many transactions this routing can, uh, I mean, this routing algorithm can process. Okay. Uh, now assume you have, um, yeah, so lambda is the average number of transactions per second then you will have uh, more or less lambda times eta many seeds in your uh, in your tree okay uh, and so you apply the the formula that we had earlier you apply it with n equal uh, lambda eta and what we want we want to find so we want to know how many uh, how many routing tasks can one node manage so we want lambda uh, so that uh, Tn, so Tn is the time taken with the big formula that we had earlier. Uh, we want lambda times Tn smaller than one because that uh, this lambda Tn smaller than one means that the node can treat all the incoming transaction in less than one second, okay? And so we get this formula. Uh, and yes, it, uh, note that it doesn't depend on eta actually because, uh, because of the fact that we uh, split the tree in k many, uh, yeah, in k many trees. So uh, the eta is actually hidden in k, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't impact how fast the lookup is. Uh, well, very slightly, uh, negligibly impacted. Uh, okay, so now we still have uh, two. Oh, yeah, we have two uh, parameters, k and l. Uh, so th this is a mistake. It should be small l. So this is the l, which is here. Uh, so we still need to choose, uh, I mean, to fix these parameters. So I chose L equals eight because um, 
it's uh, more or less the, it's the average of number of neighbors in the Lightning network. And so in, uh, I mean, it's safe to assume that in general, uh, a node will not receive the same seed more than uh, the number of neighbors that it has. So we can upper bound, at least we can uh, upper bound L by eight. So if we set L equals to eight, uh, then here, again, with my computer, uh, here you have the different uh, values for the maximum lambda for different values of K. Uh, so you see that if, uh, so remember that K uh, is uh, the number of matches which the node will receive, uh, which we can't completely estimate, but it shouldn't be too big anyway. Uh, and you see that if it's only one, then uh, you can, the node can reach uh, 10, more than 10,000 transactions. Uh, okay, so one last remark is that this tells us that if you take, if you have k equals one, a node can manage uh, 10,000 transactions per second. But actually, uh, even, even if one node can only manage 10,000 transactions, uh, potentially the network as a whole can manage more than that because um, you don't actually need all the nodes to be able to uh, process all the incoming routing tasks. Because even um, if you send pheromones everywhere, even if some of the nodes are not uh, processing your seeds, then if you have enough nodes processing it, then the routing, the routing task uh, will still uh, be successful. So um, this actually let us hope I mean, these, uh, these figures let us hope that it can actually manage uh, more than 10,000 transactions uh, per seconds. And uh, I will stop here. Thank you.